All right. Good evening, everybody. Tonight we're going to continue the study of Minor Prophet Ezra in Chapter 9. And I'm going to read it all. And I do thank Joel for enlightening us some and cutting off at exactly the best place he could have for me to pick it up. So, let, But we're going to start reading with verse 1 and go all the way through the end. When these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of these lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers have been foremost in this trespass. So when I heard this thing, I tore my garments and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard, and I sat down astonished. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting and having torn my dark garments and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord. And I said, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation, as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves. Yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? We have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, with the uncleanness of the people of the lands, with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us, so that there would be no remnant or survivor? O Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant, as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. I apologize for missing last week, and I'm very thankful for Joel, as I said, for covering the first five verses. And I'm going to sum up everything from last week, for anybody that might have missed it, like me, in one sentence. The leaders came to Ezra and told him the people, particularly the priests and Levites, had been intermarrying with local pagans against Levitical law, and had defiled the purity of Israel, which, for some reason, came as a surprise to Ezra, who, in his astonished state, immediately plucked some of his beard and hair 
tore his clothing, and fell on his knees before God and before the assembly for the night sacrifice of the Israelites, who were also terrified saying this. That was one sentence. I didn't say it was going to be a short sentence. But now we want to go on, starting in verse 6. And this is where Ezra is speaking to God for the rest of the chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, we're going to hear about the people's reaction to Ezra's humble prayer, which brings about one of the more poignant returns to God in the Israelite history. But that's next week. Ezra begins with verse 6, speaking. And I said, O my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Again, it sure sounds like Ezra did not seem to be aware of what the folks that had come back first, the local Israelites, had been doing. But he humbly falls before God, ashamed to lift his face before God because of the overwhelming nature of our sins. Did you catch that? Our sins. He wasn't saying, you know, this is their sin. He took the responsibility on himself as leader. Ezra had not intermarried. He was a leading scribe and a priest of the second group of exiled Israelites that were returning from Babylon captivity. And this was about 80 years, depending upon who you listen to, after the start of the temple. So the people had been coming back into the land for quite a while. And that was at the rebuilding of the temple that was a direction or directed by Cyrus. And he refers to that in his prayer. This to me is a sign of a true leader, one who takes responsibility for the failure of those under him. It doesn't matter if he didn't even know it. It is a sign of real integrity and leadership in him to take possession of that, to claim the sin as his own. It is also a sign of why and how God made Israel great. And it's something we really don't have much concept of in our rugged, individualistic American culture. Our mentality is we do it on our own. That is as far from the Jewish mentality as you can get. The answer to the question that Cain asked God after murdering his brother, am I my brother's keeper? The answer to that is important, and it's yes. And here Ezra is displaying that by diving in there and defending his brothers and sisters. God created us in his image. He created us for community. He created us for relationship, not just with him, but with one another. And that is part of our being. And one of the most devastating thing that men in particular can do and often seek is to be their own man, to make it on their own. To not, and I don't mean without God, although many do that. I mean without the help of your brothers and your sisters in Christ. And we need that community to stand. Ezra's acceptance of the sins of his brothers and of the people over whom God had placed him in authority shows us a deep truth that we are our brother's keepers and that we are responsible when a brother falls to sin. Do you see how easy it would have been for Ezra to come back and say to God, look how these outcasts have sinned. God, you deal with them. And then we can resume our righteous place in the land that you promised us. I'm not sure I wouldn't have gone at it that way. But can you see how easy that would have been for most men? So if they screwed up, you know, that's on them. 
But no, Ezra claimed that our sins were over our heads and had risen to heaven. So he was taking the point on take, doing something about the sin. Ezra's lament continues in verse 7, pointing out how great the sin of God's people had been over the years and how it was continuing. And he shows he understands that being subject to the enemies of Israel was allowed by God both as a correction and as a consequence for the sins of the people. And God still does that. We are going to often, and we'll get to that in a little bit, that we usually don't get all the consequences of our sins or we die, but we are often subjected to consequences as a method of correction of God helping us through it. It's not punishment as most see it. Now, punishment can ultimately happen, but as beloved children, it's always going to be done by God for us in a manner that is for our good and for his glory. Okay. And I lost my spot. Okay. He... Uh, is talking about knowing the consequences and he expresses an understanding of how holy God is, of his holiness and how willful disobedience does have consequences. So in, in verse eight, Ezra, Ezra's prayer turns to recognition of God's grace and his love for his people and for the opportunity they have had after the release from their bondage. And it's a bondage that Ezra knows very well firsthand. It was most, if not all, of his life. So he recognizes the hope they have been given in a very large way by being given freedom. And he recognizes that it's an undeserved gift from a loving father. This theme continues in verse 9 as he outlines God's unfailing love even during the bondage, and how God used pagan kings to bless his people, to rebuild the temple, and to restore them to the land that they had lost through rejecting God, but which God had promised them. In verse 10, we again see Ezra's deep sorrow and lament that despite all God had done to restore them, his people are still disobedient and without excuse. And again, it can only be understood in the context of the strong community bond of all the Israelite people to God and to one another. How many times in the past have all the people been punished because of the sins of a few or even one? It is critical that we understand that level of community and being bonded with one another. All right. I didn't read this in any commentary. It might be out there somewhere, and I could be entirely wrong. But in verses 10 and 11, and it may have started as early as verse 7, but I see Ezra transitioning his prayer to God into being something of a sermon and a speaking to the people. Remember, he's in a public gathering when this is taking place. And it's for a sac sacrifice at the temple. And he's speaking to the people in his prayer as well as God. Now, this may come as a complete shock to you, but sometimes religious leaders will use their prayer to speak to the earthly audience rather than just to God to whom the prayer is intended. Now, that sounds wrong, doesn't it? And it can be, but not necessarily. And I think there's an intent here in drawing the people back to God. Just so you can test me on this, because like I said, I made this up while I was studying it. So it may be out there somewhere else, but let's read verse 10 again. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments 
which you commanded by your servants, the prophet, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, with the uncleanness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters as your sons. And he continues on through 13, talking about the law. And uh, finishes up, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Do you kind of see where it looks like he's talking to the people? I mean, he is still praying to God, and that's clear. But he's first asking a very important question to God, but it's one all the people need to answer. It's, oh, our God, what shall we say after this? And again, third person, not first. It's what should I, not what I should say, what should we say? Come on in. We're going to have a lot of time together after I finish yapping, but that's okay. I knew I didn't want to stand up here a real long time. <laughs> so he asks, he repeats to God in the prayer, you know, what shall we say after this? And he's directing the question to God. But he immediately says, for we've forsaken your commandments, and what should we say about this? And it is for all the people. All righty. And he, throughout all of this, he is still using the first person plural, not the the second, you guys, and not first person singular. I did this. It's always we. It's always us. And that does sort of take us back to the community relationship there. All right. He's telling all these things to God about the Levitical and Deuteronomy laws that are against the intermarriage against the abomination of land, all these things that he's referring to, God already knows. The people already know. So why is he belaboring that? I think at the very least, Ezra is remembering them to remind himself of how they failed. And by the way, this is a great model of a confessional prayer for us today. If you go through this, and I'm reading it multiple times towards that end. I mean, you want to be familiar with this because this is a good model for prayer. There's nothing wrong with nonspecific prayers asking God to forgive you of all your sins. I hope everybody in here has prayed that more than once. That God forgive me my sins. Do you think about your sins when you're praying that normally? I know I often don't. I'll say it just because I know I'm supposed to. And I know he forgives me of all my sins. That's why Jesus died. But do I belabor what those sins are? Very rarely. So, and there is, like I said, nothing wrong with having a general prayer that is asking for forgiveness of all your sins. However, if you are burdened with a specific sin, there may be a little detail about what the sin is, is in order. Also, how you knew it was a sin. That's in here. And being thankful for God's grace and mercy. Do you think God might enjoy that type of communication with him a bit more than, I'm sorry, God, forgive me? We're made in his image. So when you think about, would this please God or would this displease God? And I think most folks in here are fathers. You think about, would that please me if it was my son? Or would that displease me if, if it was my son? We want to apply those things. Now, we can go overboard with, if I can say the word, anthropomorphizing God, making him to be a man. 
but he absolutely says that we're created in his image, which means we can look at ourselves and at least get an idea of how God reacts to different things. So God, and again, he created us to be relational. He's relational. How many of you realize that the very first reference to God in the Bible before man, before any of creation, is plural. He, he started in relationship, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and he started us in relationship, walking in the garden. And that was before there was any sin. And that is ultimately the goal of why Jesus came for us. He wants to continue that relationship. But it has to be in a place of holiness. Because God can't abide sin, can't abide evil. And our fall took us there. So we need Jesus for that. When we sell him short in the relationship, who does that hurt the most? When we don't go to him in prayer time. When we're not studying his word. And I'm going to point at you like this because I'm very guilty of that. I get busy and, oh, you know, God, I haven't even offered this to you today. But does he like it when we say, oh, you know, God, I really should have prayed about that first? Or is he going to punish us for not praying to him about it? I don't, that's really more of a rhetorical question because I think it depends entirely on the circumstances. But our, again, our punishment from God or the consequences of our actions from God are always for our good to give us the opportunity to come back to him. But when we are not in that relational place with him, we're the ones that it hurts. Does it hurt him? Yes. But it hurts us far more. I want to give you a little illustration. I guess this is also a little confession from my past. And I honestly don't remember my apology, or even if I did apologize, but the event was real. And I want you to think about what my earthly father would have liked to hear most in these two offered apologies after I get a little wet. Okay. I've just wrecked my father's dune buggy, which he loves as a 16, yeah, 16 year old driver. So I come, come to him and say, Dad, i Sorry I wrecked the dune buggy, but you know how sharp that curve is, and I didn't think I was going too fast, and, and I only bumped the curb. I wouldn't really expect that kind of damage to the axle. I mean, it's a dune buggy. It's supposed to go off-road and hit curbs and things. Is that going to impress my father? Or something like this. Dad, I'm so sorry I hurt the dune buggy. I know how special it is to you. I was enjoying it too, and even though I know how sharp, sharp ah, I can't talk, how sharp that curve is on Academy, I thought it'd be fun to see how fast I could take it. And I lost control and hit the curb. And I know you have no reason to ever trust me driving it again, but if you do, I promise I'm going to slow down and be more careful. I love you, and I know you love me, and I'm so sorry I've disappointed you. Which is my father going to respond to more lovingly? B. Yeah. Is there anything that stops us from going to God like that? By the way, right in that second, I, second one, I felt a lot like Eddie Haskell, but it, it really was. I had the level of love for my father that I could have done that. And if you don't know who Eddie Haskell is, you're young. 
I'm sure Leave It to Beaver has been in reruns for the last 50 years, though, have it? <laughs> has it? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to get at here? Be relational with God. That's what he wants. Now, Ezra finishes in verse 15, and it is the way he should finish. He's relying on God's mercy and grace. Let's read that one more time. O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous. For we are left as a remnant, as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt. Though no one can stand before you because of this. And this here is our sin. And this for us is whatever sin we're dealing with in the moment. It can be an abiding one we've been struggling with all our life. Or it can be just a moment of stupidity. And I'm willing to bet we all have both. I know I do. We cannot stand, or as he put earlier in the prayer, we can't even lift our head when we are being overwhelmed by our sin in his presence. We can't stand before a righteous God when we're guilty. And we are guilty. But recognize that the good news, which is what gospel means, the good news isn't something we hear that's wonderful, although it is that, but it is a person. It is Jesus Christ. He is the gospel. And telling others about him is spreading the gospel. And it's through his righteousness that we are able to stand before God without shame or without condemnation. So let's do that. 